And so I will now introduce the last talk before the, we have the little break. And this is Dr. Alessia Errico from Cancer Research Horizons. Uh, Dr. Alessia is Associate Director for Search and Evaluation at Cancer Research Horizons and leads a team for finding new opportunities arising from Cancer Research UK funded uh, science, both in the UK and internationally. Alessia, thank you very much for being here. We're looking forward to your talk and from research to impact, navigating the pathways of research translation and commercial commercialization. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'll try to share my screen. Um, um, can you just um, say yes. if you're seeing it? Yes. 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 Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, hello, everyone. So thank you very much for having me here today. I'm really excited uh, to be here. Um, and this is a topic I'm really passionate about, not just because of my work, but is also one of the reasons why I transition from being a scientist to now a technology transfer professional, if you like, because I wanted really to have more impact, um, was not able to do it through my scientific activities and shifted to have a different type of job. Um, so um, I work for Cancer Research Horizons, uh, and uh, by the way, I'll be happy to take questions at the end, or if you want to post during the chat, uh, very happy to, to answer your questions. So Cancer Research UK and Cancer Research Horizons, so I'm a bit uh, of a, we are one of these organizations that touch different boxes that have been mentioned before. We are a funder through Cancer Research UK, we are a technology transfer office. And in a, in a way, and we're also an innovation engine. So uh, as Cancer Research Horizons, our main objective is, is that to complement the science funded by Cancer Research UK in a way that we can maximize its impact through um, making sure the cutting edge innovation are translated into treatments uh, for cancer and diagnostic for cancer patients. Uh, we do that on different levels. We have a, a team of experts from intellectual property to the business development to project development um, to try and support uh, the opportunities uh, we um, scout. But also we've got access to funding, uh, what is called usually translational gap funding to uh, make sure that projects can follow on. Uh, but also we have a, a seed fund in our venture team that enables setting up startup company. And we have access to a network of an infrastructure and capabilities through our therapeutic innovation that allow uh, drug discovery and drug development. So um, we, before going into a bit more the detail of how you navigate this, um, uh, this pathway, I just wanted to give you a few figures to give you an idea of who we are. So, so far, uh, uh, since the inception of Cancer Research Technology, now named Cancer Research Horizon, we have contributed to 11 drugs to be to the market. Uh, but most importantly, the drugs we've been working with, uh, on and funding research on have enabled 6 million of treatment for cancer patients throughout the world. And I think that is the real figure that gives the idea of the size of the impact. Um, we are technology transfer office. So we, of course, some of this is linked to royalties and revenues. And so far we have um, had revenue for over 500 million pounds, which gets reinvested in research through Cancer Research UK. So, but why we are here today? We're here today to talk about translating research from the bench to the bedside. And that is what I call the research to impact life cycle, which probably is a bit more fancy than technology transfer cycle, but it's the same. Um, and it's when you go from the research you do in the lab to identifying an invention that is evaluated, you de decide if it's appropriate to have some uh, intellectual property protection in place that you know was mentioned just before, and then development occurs until you're ready to market um, your uh, uh, technology and take one of the commercialization route. And the cycle you know, goes on, brings economic growth, and then can be reinvested in research. I mean, the importance of converting academic research into uh, practical, economically viable and a beneficial application for patients is, is, in, is not only at the you know, patient benefit, economic growth, as we mentioned, the fostering innovation and maximizing research impact, but there is something in more in there, I think, from the researcher's perspective. Uh, this, you know, socializing with the commercial context and the new networks can have a positive impact on the research agenda. Um, there can be a positive effort on publishing. Um, there is a greater reach in terms of impact because of the applicability that is in your discoveries, but also you can mobilize financial support by bringing bringing more funding to your lab. Um, so how do you go about translating your ideas? 
So this is like a very schematic, a very simple schematic of uh, um, a translational path. Um, and the truth is that everything starts with your idea or the discoveries that you're making in the lab. Um, your research will lead to new funding. And if those new fundings have got the potential to become application or intervention, then you should consider um, intellectual property protection. Um, and that is important because that will give you um, a sort of competitive advantage and maximize the chance of your success. Now, the patent is a passive mean to do something. So just having a patent doesn't enable you to have um, that advantage, but at least it gives you that protection that you are the first there. And if you do something, you, you are actually protected by those rights. Uh, now, what do you have to consider? You have to consider that by if you want to protect something, you need to have something that is new. Um, and in Europe, uh, if you disclose something before you are considering, if you disclose your research, your data, before you are considering um, intellectual property, then you're not able to protect anymore because it's already out there uh, in the public domain. And that applies as to a talk, uh, to a conference, to a talk in another research institute that is not yours, but of course, through the normal publication. Um, and so uh, it's also important always when you're about to disclose your science to consider if should you protect that. And I agree, you know, with um, what was said before, patent uh, protection is not the only means and it should be considered because it's costly. But from our perspective, what we, believe, what we think is that if you as an academic needs to disclose and there is something in there, we are happy to take the risk and file early on that opportunity rather than losing the, losing the opportunity to protect it and having the advantage um, from the onset. There are countries where you can then um, file, even if you're disclosed, for example, in the States, you've got a 12 months grace period, but then that limits a lot what you can do because you can only work in the US. So having said that, once you've got an idea of what, what your discovery is, you make a plan for protecting it, and there are, your technology transfer office will help you evaluate that. But as a rule of thumb, if you've got an idea, is novel, is addressing a problem, um, and you think there is an application, then you can start considering those aspects. The second bit is developing, because once you have got the idea, having you file a patent or not, because sometimes you might make the active decision, I don't have to disclose, I hold off to file that patent, because that will start a clock. Um, and in 12 months, you'll have to make another costly decision. And then 18 months, there is another costly decision. So you might decide to hold off, but still you have to think about your development plan. And that needs to be done by working with your technology transfer office or organization like us to try and, and see what do you need? What will make then your application, for example, your patent stronger? Or what do you need in terms of validation to prove that your application can work? Um, and that is important, you know, because sometimes what you've discovered in the, in, in the lab doing your research, applica, applying your research grant uh, has got true potential, but you might need to do some proof of concept experiments, which you, you would not normally do for your publication, but that are essential to prove the application and the potential of the technology. So, um, and it's, it's important to, to actually think about who to talk to, because um, if you're doing a basic research project, always you know think early about what is at the end of the spectrum. Is it the patient? Who is going to use your application? Is it clinicians? Try to talk to all your stakeholders and understand early on what the needs are. And I'll come to some key considerations here um, in terms of evaluating your idea. So be mindful of disclosures, as we said before, but also think what is the problem that you are solving? Is it a real problem? Often, you know, uh, you think of the problem later on. So what I find sometimes that you try to shoehorn a problem into a solution that you found, but it's, 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 it's better to think up front about the problem and then developing a solution that fits that exact problem because that is all there, you know, is have you got a solution and have you got a problem? Is there an unmet need that you're trying to address? That is truly important to, for the definition of application. And if you've got that, how does that compare to what is already available? Why someone should use your solution over someone else? Is it cheaper? Is it faster? Um, will you will be applicable to more patients? What is your target population? Or if you like target market, but so who is going to use it? How big is this market? How big is the population? That is not only a commercial aspect, it's also how easy it's going to be for you to validate that technology.
And then, of course, think about the implementation up front. Who is going to be the end user, we said? What is going to be the route? Um, how, how can clinician change clinical practice? I'll give you an example. If, if your technology or idea is, um, is leading to withholding treatment, that is a very difficult thing for a clinician to, you know, to uptake withholding treatment or a patient with cancer. So all these things need to be factored in first. And the other thing I hear a lot nowadays is that you have to think about health economics quite ahead of time. Um, and, and that is something that perhaps we are not used to. And that wa that's why it's worth growing your network and trying to understand of those problems that are downstream, you know, your idea, but that, that uh, are needed for implementing your solution quite upfront, because then you can plan for it. So we move along, you know, once you've developed your projects and you've got something that uh, you can start engaging partners or industry or investor with, you, you can make the decision. Now, some people make the decision quite early on. I've worked with scientists that know very early on, I want to start up a company, that's what I want to do. But there are different routes to commercialization. And I think you will be hearing more talks later into the day, today and tomorrow about what are the different routes. But you, you know, there are many and you can be flexible and there is no one size fit all. So you can go through a collaboration with industry or alliances. In our organization, we've got different alliances with industry around thematic, thematic area, but you can have the classical licensing route, which is probably one of the most popular within normal technology transfer office in university is the easier one as well. Um, where you basically have got a commercial partner that can license your technology uh, under a license agreement. And sometimes those can be associated with research and collaboration agreement for an initial co-development with your lab, and that will bring funding to your lab as well. But the other option is to spin out. Um, and so we set up a company that will take forward the development of your technology and that you'll have to attract investment to support your company. Um, and us as an organization can support on that perspective and can also invest in companies. Um, and we don't have um, to work only with Cancer Research UK funded scientists, but as long as you the solution and the companies in the cancer space, we're happy to hear about it. So, what consideration to make at that point? I think it's important to understand what is right for you. We are all different. So what does work for you? Um, when you think about your technology, do you want to continue leading on it or do you want to find a partner from day one? What type of control you want to have? Um, understand your role and how you plan to balance that with your academic work as well, because that can be a challenge at the beginning. And talk to your technology transfer office um, and also to people that have done it before to understand what um, what is um, what is in there. And I think, you know, I heard about the legal advice. Legal advice is also very important. And usually, you know, it's important to have your personal legal advice, not only what the university and TTO offer. But above all, what is important is that different strategies can, ex can coexist, especially at the beginning. So you have to be flexible and ready to pivot to, to make sure that you give the maximum chances of success to your technology. So if you're thinking about spinning out, then I, I wanted to sort of flag some general tips from this perspective. The team is very important. Um, you need to you know, make sure that you consider your team size and that you've got complementary experience, you're aligned on goal. Uh, but there are, those are people you want to work with because you'll spend loads of time with them. So make sure um, you, you, know, you are happy um, working with those people and they add value to what you are doing. Um, think about your role that you have got as a founder of the company, but the company will grow in, and um, the needs of the company will change. So you might not be able to have a prominent role while the company is growing and then they will need a more experienced CEO, for example. Um, select investors as you think about the team members. They need to add value, not just bring money. Um, and consider the life cycle of a company. I've just mentioned that before. Be flexible, uh, we said. But it's very important to think about your end point from day one. Uh, and that is called exit strategy, usually for a startup. But the important bits, if you want to translate something, is make sure that you've got sight of the end point from the beginning so you can plan for that. And when you talk about, you know, we've spoken about, I think at the beginning, um, in the previous talk, we talked about the uh, money, the royalties and what comes in. Just, you know, money is good, but make, sh make sure you keep in mind that a small slice of a big cake is really better than a big slice of a small cake or a zero cake. So keep that in mind. 
Now, what I wanted to come to is, is so this concept that I show you this research to impact life cycle, which I think is, you know, is, is really important. And I don't think there is any more um, something like just basic research disconnected from the rest. Um, and what is important in my mind is recognizing that entrepreneurship is a mindset. It doesn't exclusively mean to set up a company, but you can still drive your research findings from, you know, one point to patients without setting up a company. But it's about thinking about the application and what do you need to make that a reality? Um, and when we interviewed a number of people about um, why they want to translate research and why they want to be entrepreneur, the key thing was translating discovery into patient benefits. So that's why uh, the researcher wants to do it. It's not really about, you know, there might be a financial benefit, there might be something cool about starting a company, but what you do it is to bring something to the patients. And so to try and help um, address um, what the researcher was telling us, they wanted to do this. They wanted to be entrepreneurial, but there are a number of barriers out there. Some are linked to the skills that people believe they don't have. Some are linked to the balancing the academic life with their uh, being entrepreneur or um, their academic career, right? Because if you don't want to file a patent, then hopefully you cannot publish a paper. And if you're not publishing a paper, you might not get your next grant. So everything needs to be balanced and managed. So what we thought, uh, what we did is was set up um, uh, something that is called the Cancer Research Horizon Entrepreneurial Program. And that is meant to support researchers tackle those barriers and overcome this activation barrier so they can be more entrepreneurial. And those has got a range of innovation competition, innovation events. We run um, Innovation Summit every year. We've got our um, awards ceremony coming up uh, later in March uh, this year, where we celebrate people that have um, contributed to entrepreneurial effort in the oncology field, not just funded by us. We've got um, several business accelerators we partner with where we uh, want people to go on and start um, e experiencing what they can do with their idea, uh, testing the market, getting advice from mentors, um, and so on. And that is there for everyone that works in the cancer space and is based in the UK. You don't need to fund be funded by us. And recently, we launched a mentorship program in um, partnership with the Wellcome Trust that is open to all cancer researchers in the UK that are interested in translation. And we do this through partnership. At the bottom of this slide, you see all the partners that we have got, um, that we have on this program. You can go on the website and see what is actually live. A new opportunity will come there. And so please have a look at it. And this is a snapshot that probably is better than the slide I presented before to see all the activity we have done. Um, it's quite um, an intense program, but what we want to do is tell people that we actually care about this and we reward entrepreneurship or the entrepreneurial mindset as such. So I wanted to conclude the talk today and leave some time for questions just by flagging some general tips about yourself as an entrepreneurial minded researcher. Um, try to understand yourself and your goals. What is that you want to do? Um, and that will then help you understand how you want to translate and commercialize your research. Uh, it is important, you know, that I use the two words a bit interchangeably, translation and commercialization. And the reason why I do that is because at some point the commercialization is, is crucial because the money involved in taking something to the end goal, to the end point, is too much that academia cannot do it on its own. Engage with your technology transfer office quite early on. Talk to them. Talk to us if you've got interaction with us. We are happy to talk to everyone. Um, we actually interact globally because we've got our Cancer Grand Challenge. So we deal a lot with IP from multiple institutions. And we act as a, a middle point, a broker that sort of lead in commercialization to avoid any issue with IP fragmentation in it. Um, grow your support network, mentors, peers, consultants, just talk to all the people, talk to patients as well. It's really important to understand what you think is a problem to them. Is it a problem to, to you? Is it a problem to them as well? Who is your key stakeholder there? Socialize with your entrepreneurial ecosystem. They're all the region in UK are very different. So you need to make sure you know yours. Um, we talk about all the other bits, but I think I want to come to the crucial bit there. Listen to feedback. Be comfortable with failure. Actually, failure is only a step a step to success. It's not should not be seen as a negative. Fail cheap and fail fast so you can reach success quicker. Um, and the more, most important thing I think people should always concentrate on is probably what you don't know. Because if you know what you don't know, then you can complement it. You can get people in the team that can support you. You just know how to act. But if you if you are there and you don't realize you don't know something, then it's a very difficult gap to fill and it will come out when you talk to other people. 
So I think uh, that is the end of my talk. Um, I can skip this one and I happy to leave some time for questions. Hopefully there is time for questions. Thank you. Hi, Alessia. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm afraid there's not time for questions because we have our break now, but I want to read you a comment in, that came in the Q&A box because um, <clears throat> not a question, but just a comment to Alessia's talk. This is exactly what I'm interested in, translating my research into the benefits of patients. I'm not really interested in starting and running a company or even in patenting. Thank you for showing this difference. So on that note, thanks for a wonderful talk and thanks to all the speakers of this session. Uh, we will take a break uh, and be back in 10 minutes and in where I am, this is uh, 10 past four Central European time. I don't know what time it is where you guys are. So thanks for a great session and we will be back in 10 minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Alessia.